Oh, hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm here uh, with my colleague and we'll introduce ourselves in a moment. But just to say um, we are here to talk a bit about our the sense of coming to terms with not knowing um, honesty, accountability and welcoming others in ethnography. So the idea for us for the next sort of 10 minutes or so is just for for us to have a little short conversation about some of the things that we are, have been thinking of and thinking about in terms of our experiences of uh, doing ethnography. So my name is Tracy Cosley and I'm currently a senior lecturer in the Department of Language and Linguistics at the University of Essex and I am happily joined uh, by my colleague or with my colleague uh, Colin. Um, Thanks Tracy, uh, so my name is Colin Riley and I'm a senior research officer in the Department of Language and Linguistics at the University of Essex and also a teaching associate at the University of Glasgow. Um, so maybe to start a conversation Tracy, a question for you. Um, so thinking about how you sort of came to ethnography, what sort of research you've done in the past, and then also kind of how you were prepared for that research in terms of training and things like that. Yes, absolutely. So my my background is in, uh, my undergraduate degree was in social anthropology. Um, so within that framework we were we talked a lot about ethnography and we talked a lot about um i guess ethnography early ethnographies and ethnographies in around the 1990s it was the time that i was doing my um undergraduate degree so thinking a lot about sort of you know how how people are represented in research and how we look at um notions of other um and explore notions of other um that was so that was one level of the training i had and then at, for my master's degree and for my um phd we had sort of very standard and this was the same for my undergraduate degree as well in many ways but a standard sort of methodology training um and so again really interesting um looking a lot at different types of research methods um, and critically evaluating different styles of research um, and different types of training there um, but not necessarily things around, um, I, I think I think it would be fair to say that we had very much a kind of a, even though we knew it was problematic, a model of maybe a sort of a lone ethnographer, maybe. So thinking about how we might go into the field um, if we were doing kind of data collection in that way, um, but not necessarily thinking too much at that time about um, how language was involved in the processes. Um, certainly, you know, we, there would be conversations about language as a, as an issue or as a challenge, but not necessarily, you know, looking at it beyond that or language as the object of um, the data collection. And um, so I think kind of really, you know, very valuable training in all kinds of different ways, um, but not necessarily something that uh, dealt too much with questions around multilingualism and or monolingualism in, in research. Um, so my ethnographic work up until the projects that I've been involved in with you and other colleagues has really sort of been, I think, again, always interested in, in multilingual contexts. And I've worked mostly in classrooms and trying to understand multilingual classrooms from the perspective of students and teachers. And how do how do um, classrooms come together in in dealing with language or learning language and learning through other languages? Um, but yeah, I think I've I think I, if I'm honest with myself and if I'm honest with the account of myself in that research, have done that largely monolingually. So through the medium of English, students or colleagues may have used or drawn upon other languages in their sort of um, in interviews that we've done or in data collection. But largely the context that I've been in has meant that even though the students or the teachers that I've been working with are multilingual, the, the process has been done um, very much sort of monolingually, I think. Um, and so how, how about for you? What's your, uh, I guess, similar questions? What are your, what, how has your training been and what kinds of projects have you been involved in and, and the role of language within those? Um, quite similar, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, so I think, so my undergrad was in English language um, and I think it was introduced to linguistic ethnography. It would have been in like an honours years module um, that and then it covered linguistic ethnography for a couple of weeks and that was sort of it um and then when i was doing my masters it was again like a kind of generic not ge generics maybe the wrong word but like the sort of standard research methods where you cover loads and loads of stuff and it's like a massive massive group from all different like social sciences and things um and then maybe more then getting introduced to like more 
traditional like foundational ethnographies and different um concepts and things that are sort of integral to ethnographic work um but again sort of because it was such a, a broad course that was like quite limited um and then i think then when i was doing my phd there wasn't a massive amount of specific ethnographic training but it was more a case of just kind of learning as you go sort of like going out to do it um and kind of as you said when you're thinking about language because then my phd was in english language and linguistics and it was looking at how language is used and um, language attitudes in universities in Malawi. So a multilingual context, but then like language was the object of the study and considerations of language weren't necessarily embedded throughout, I don't think, Um, but it was more of a case of kind of see how you get on, try to acquire some language skills that might be useful for you um, when doing interviews or when like doing translations and stuff afterwards. Um, but potentially kind of this lone ethnographer idea perhaps is it'll, it'll just kind of be okay. So like you'll be able to come up with something that will enable you to do it effectively uh, yourself or by getting a translator in at some point, but like later on in the, in the, in the work. Um, because I don't necessarily think that, probably it's still true, but like then when I was doing postgrad stuff, that the training that you're given across methodologies, but then like within ethnographics, that's what we're talking about, um, prepares people. So like the training that you're given in universities, like universities in the UK, doesn't necessarily prepare you to do work multilingually because it is very monolingual focused. Um, and then where, where language comes into it, it's often as an add-on or it's often as like an afterthought, potentially. Yeah, no, I think that's really similar. And I was just thinking, as you were saying that, just reflecting on my own, so with my PhD it was based in um, a primary school in, in London. So interested in English as additional language learners. So in the school that I was in, I think there were at the time over 50 or 60 different languages being used in the school, being used by members of the school, but not necessarily given the kind of policy context of, of England, not necessarily being used as a resource in the classroom. Um, and my supervisors and my you know, the context where I did my PhD was very much attuned to to language and linguistic ethnography. I mean, that was very much part of the conversations we would be having. Um, And so in that sense, really kind of um, part of what I felt that I was doing in my work. But I'm not sure that I recall a conversation with colleagues at any point that said, what, what would my research look like if I had interviewed some of my students in, in some of the other languages that they use? Um, maybe so it was interesting like I kind of if I reflect upon it now I think I think really the the the, the context that I have worked in um, uh, well until recently anyway that context really did shape the way I kind of even con- conceptualized the project I think but also the tools that I selected and how I selected them um, was really I think through a quite a monolingual quite through a monolingual lens um, and so I think that's interesting now if I think back to what you know, what I may have lost in my data potentially, or, you know, what I may have gained or the, the trade-offs. So I think we, you know, my, my supervisors and I would regularly talk about that as a, as a, as an issue that we all deal with in our research, I guess, isn't it? But that's, that was really, I think when I think about it now, what, what trade-offs were made um, as a result of that. Yeah. I th- just thinking about that, um, just as, like when it's considered as well. So like, I'm pretty sure in my PhD in the methodology or the limitation section, there's like a, a line and it's like, oh, maybe I would have got data a bit differently if I'd used particular languages. So mm-hmm. it's just like that, that's like sufficient mm-hmm. consideration of it, but it's not sufficient consideration of it. Yeah. Um, but then I think there's also like wider expectations of what, what 
research is or like what languages are allowed to be used because so when I did think about my PhD work so like when I did interviews and focus groups and things I would allow or allow um people were able to use whatever language language practices they wanted within the 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 interview in the focus group um and then sometimes afterwards particularly in the focus groups i would then also ask why people use language in particular ways um and sometimes the response was well it was because well you're like doing a phd this is like academic research so mm-hmm. we should be using english here because it's like a formal thing so there's mm-hmm. like that kind of expectation and then other times because there were other uh, instances where people would use multiple languages and then like depending on my skill level and how um, much non-English was being used, uh, I was able to follow to certain degrees at the time. But then there was also an expectation that like people would have to tailor things so that I understood stuff. Mm-hmm. So that was like, I was like the center of the, the understanding and that was what everything was like accommodated. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely, and I, th- and I think that. So, I was just thinking about that in terms of the the most recent work that we've been doing together as well, and thinking about um, the part of part of it for me. I think, and some data collection that I had done a few years ago at a local school near the university was looking at. Um, I guess people, the expectation for people that I was at school in England and as a white. British researcher, um, the, the the default or the starting point would always be English. Like, so people were assuming that that was the starting point for the conversations that we would be having, for what my interests might be. And for, even though maybe I was trying to kind of understand um, students and parents' language practices outside of schools, that actually the medium through which that would happen would be in and through English because oh, you were talking to this person. So again, sort of, I guess, sort of part of what, part of the, part of what I'm interested in, in now, I think really, and I think probably you share this interest as well, is that that sense of trying to disrupt some of those expectations and how, and how to do that um, and how to kind of shift from a, um, from a starting point that assumes a particular linguistic mode maybe or a, a, the, the, where the assumptions are that you're going to be operating in a particular way um, and how to shift that and how to open up the discussion um, from the very beginning how we are how we influence and are influenced by those structures and and where where change can happen and uh, over, based on what sort of time period as well so I think we it is interesting at the moment as well as now I think it is a period of change and I think there is a period of I think in that sense it's really quite positive in the sense that you know there are there are lots of people working in on this aren't there in a way there's lots of really exciting new publications about you know researching multilingually and how we do that so I think it is sort of there is a, a, a it feels like there's a moment where things might be changing um, but yeah, sort of what's, um, you know, what, what parts of what structures um, need, to, need to be changed and, and how that happens. I think it would be really interesting to see how that goes. Um, so yeah, I think, um, I think that draws us to probably over our time, but thank you um, for listening and, and, and for uh, any comments and discussions that might come as a result of this uh, video. So thank you very much and see you soon. Thanks, colleague.